Quat. I'm your host, Tom Kearns, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, episode 48, The End of Kent. Upon Offa's death in 796, Kent, like the rest of the nascent Mercian Empire, passed to his son and consecrated heir, Edgefrith. However, Edgefrith, in what Alcuin saw as an act of divine punishment for Offa's harsh treatment of his opponents, died less than a year after becoming king, leaving no heir in his place. Into the resulting power vacuum stepped Coenwulf, a distant cousin of Offa, who then took up the reins of power in the Midlands. In Kent, as in other kingdoms conquered by Offa, the vacuum allowed for local rulers to return and reassert themselves. In the case of Kent, this came in the figure of Eadbert Prayen, a man who had gone into exile at the court of Charlemagne. Possibly with Carolingian support, Eadbert covertly returned to Kent in 796 and launched a rebellion against Mercian rule there. Fearful of the threat this posed to his life, Archbishop Athelherd, the Mercian installed by Offa as Archbishop of Canterbury, following the death of his bitter rival Janbert, fled from Kent. Given the vacant throne in Mercia, Eadbert's rebellion does not seem to have met with much resistance. Fairly quickly upon returning, he was minting coins, although no charters survive from his reign. It seems then that he succeeded in securing a new period of Kentish independence after the decades of Mercian overlordship. In Mercia, though, Coenwulf was eager to crush this renewed Kent, but recognising Offa's tendency to alienate onlookers, Coenwulf was keen to make sure that when he moved against Kent, it would not attract international outrage. If, as seemed likely, Eadbert was acting with Carolingian backing, then Coenwulf could not risk a Carolingian campaign in support of Kent, or the disruption of trade to London. The way to ensure that no one would object to the reconquest of Kent was to obtain the backing of the Pope. There were two features of Eadbert's rebellion, especially, which Coenwulf was able to use when making his case to Rome. The first was the flight of Athelherd, Edbert, he could argue, was despoiling the church and threatening her clergy. The more damning part of his case was that while in Francia, Edbert had apparently been ordained a priest. He had illegally forsaken his ordination to undertake the rebellion, and it was on this basis that Pope Leo III announced his excommunication. This was exactly what Coenwulf needed. With Eadbert excommunicated, no good Christian king would dare intervene on his behalf, and with papal approval, the Carolingians would not risk breaking with Rome to oppose an invasion of Kent. In 798, after only two years of Kentish independence, Coenwulf launched his invasion, and we are told in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, succeeded in taking Eadbert prisoner and leading him into Mercia, at which point he was never heard of again. A later recension of the Chronicle adds the detail that Eadbert was blinded and his hands were cut off, but how reliable this is, we don't know. The point is, though, Eadbert fell to Coenwulf. Following this fall, Coenwulf did not immediately reinstate direct Mercian rule. Rather, he set up his brother Cuthred as king in Kent. Cuthred took control of the royal mints in Kent, producing some of his own coinage, as well as issuing his own charters, but with the consent of his brother. It was under Cuthred that Athelherd formally dissolved the Archbishopric of Lichfield, restoring the pre-offer balance in the Church of England, and doing away with the legacy of Offa's feud with Janbert. Following from Cuthred's death in 807, Coenwulf resumed direct Mercian rule in Kent, administering Kentish lands just like those in Mercia. The same was true for his brother Chaelwulf, who succeeded Coenwulf in 821. In 823, though, Chaelwulf was deposed by a nobleman named Beornwulf. At this time, the moneyers in Canterbury began issuing coins in the name of a king, Baldred. Who this Baldred was is unknown. Some scholars suggest that he was a Kentish king who broke away from Mercian rule following the rise of Beornwulf. In this view, he'd be probably a Kentish noble who seized the opportunity. 
Other scholars, though, point out the alliteration of Beowulf and Baldred, and suggest that Baldred may have been the Mercian king's brother, and was set up in Kent as a puppet. Following the cataclysmic defeat of Beowulf's army at Elendon in 825, where Edgbert of Wessex, possibly the son of the Kentish king Aelmund, who had been deposed by Offa in 785, effectively ended the Mercian supremacy south of the Thames, Kent was left exposed to West Saxon ambitions. Dividing his army in two following the battle, and placing the second army under the command of his son Athelwulf, Edgbert ordered this second force to march east and drive out Baldred and assert the West Saxon hegemony over Kent, Sussex, Essex and Surrey. Athelwulf seems to have met with little resistance doing this, possibly due to his being a descendant of Aelmund and the people of Kent showed no loyalty to the erstwhile Baldred, who, if he was not a Mercian puppet, was certainly an upstart with no familial claim to the throne. From 825 on, Kent and the rest of the kingdoms south of the Thames were ruled directly by the kings of Wessex, and were treated as de facto part of the West Saxon kingdom. This may have been less galling to Kentish pride, since the West Saxon kings were, after all, related to the Kentish royal line, unlike the Mercians. But regardless of how they felt about it, Kent's independence was finally ended in 825, and her fate was bound up first with that of Wessex, and then, ultimately, with the fate of England itself. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. I've been your host, Tom Kearns, and I hope you'll join me again next time. <laughs>